Hi, I'm Ben Carlson with Thatcher Aircraft. I uh, just want to do a little intro to this video. Um, this is the second time we've done this. A couple, a bunch of us, 15, something like that, got together on a call and just talked about the different Thatcher designs, um, our, where we're at with our builds, um, you know, questions, comments, issues, um, foibles. Uh, and anyways, it was a, a good chat and I uh, hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, you can reach out um, thatcheraircraft.com. You can get all my contact information. Uh, otherwise, uh, Dave Thatcher, the designer of the airplanes, his website is thatchercx4.com and uh, you can order plans from him, that sort of thing. And, and I'm uh, simply the kit manufacturer, parts manufacturer. So, uh, Anyways, thanks for joining us and I uh, hope you enjoy. Cool. So it looks like we have a lot of people on here. Uh, I'm going to switch over to the gallery view and see you. Yeah, it looks like we have about seven or eight people. Cool. Um, so I guess we're a couple minutes past our start time, so we'll just get started, I guess. So uh, I'm Ben Carlson. I am uh, um, have Thatcher Aircraft LLC, and I'm making parts and kits and stuff. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I have the ability to mute everybody if need be for background noise or things like that feedback sometimes there's some issues it sounds pretty good this morning so i'll just leave it be um but if if you um if if something happens i'll i can go in and just mute people um also um if you can't if you're trying to talk but nobody's hearing you there's a chat uh button um in here that you can pose a chat question in um here i'll, I'll type it in chat uh in there and so you should see a little flashing orange or yellow or something little light that says chat and so if you click on that it'll come up and say you so anyway so if, i'll kind of keep an eye on that so if you're having issues with hearing or with seeing or something or if you want to interject but don't want to uh, interrupt somebody go ahead and pop in there and we'll try to get back um anyways uh so yeah so i didn't really have too much of an agenda this morning um last last week we just kind of went around and did introductions norm was on last week um and so, um, I, you know, I guess we could probably start there, just uh, go around. So, like I said, I'm Ben Carlson, Thatcher Aircraft LLC. Um, my background, I uh, worked as a machinist for a few years. I worked uh, doing um, industrial uh, uh, machine building, machine design, uh, sort of thing, 20-some years ago, um, and ended up getting into the programming computer side of things. And so I've been an um, enterprise architect for uh, designing computer systems, uh, website systems, e-commerce for about actually right around 20 20 ish years um and uh background of airplanes um my dad had his pilot's license before i was born um and uh, we had friends and neighbors that flew um so i've been flying small in small planes all my life um finally got around to working on my pilot's license uh about four years ago give or take something like that um because i realized it was kind of affordable and uh found this the thatcher design i thought man i gotta build that um, and my dad's been building his plane for a number of years. I've had um, helped out some people in our EA chapter and stuff in, in the past. And so, uh, um, yeah, so that's kind of my, my general background. Um, and so I fell into this uh, aircraft manufacturing stuff about two years ago, give or take. Um, went down to uh, Georgia and talked with, um, uh, oh, no, I lost for his name. Anyways, um, uh, Westbury, Greg Westbury, uh, who, was doing this before me and uh, picked up, and so I'm making parts and kits and having a blast. So, anyways, that's me. So, Ron, do you wanna you wanna go next? Uh, you're kind of my top left corner. Yeah, Ron Whittington, and I'm at a little airport uh, in Zulu, Texas, which is about uh, 10 miles east of uh, San Antonio. And Very I've cool. got a Thatcher a Thatcher CX4 project that I bought from a young man uh, in Florida last year. Good deal. Uh, Very good. I'm retired. Uh, I'm retired from uh, plastics quality control. Like uh, injection molding, that kind of thing? Actually, we made the resins for Oh, plastic. okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. Very cool. All right. So QA. All right. Good deal. And uh, I see Norm's on here. Um, if you want to give your short uh, bio. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Norm Cruz here, semi-retired. I just do paperwork for the VA. Um, teleworking a lot now, so that helps with the project. 
as you can see behind me is my Thatcher CX-5. Um, I purchased uh, a little bit of it, um, like part of the fuselage and um, the wing spars from the, the first builder. And then um, I'm doing the rest of it. Um, I'm using a Revmaster 2200 with a uh, magneto uh, ignition. And um, my current phase is I'm, and as you can see, installing the canopy. So uh, I'm being humbled by that experience. And uh, that's where we're at. Thank you. Uh, Norm, where are you at? Where are you at? I'm, uh, I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm, I was trying to keep it short because last I was on last week and gave a big spiel. But yeah, I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. I live under Class Bravo airspace, and I fly out of. Uh, I will be flying out of either two, one of two airports, either North Las Vegas Air Terminal or, La, or Henderson Executive, and they're both within 30 nautical miles of um, McCarran International. Uh, so I I have to have ADSB, and I'm probably going to install ADSB uh, out and in. Um, just because it makes sense around here. Yeah. You got your ELT figured out last week then. It sounds like I saw your emails afterwards. So Yeah, it, it got delivered. Um, I plan on installing the ELT sometime after this uh, canopy gets on. There's a couple things that came in the mail. Um, I'm going to finish up the engine baffling, install the ELT, uh, and also um, I might start installing the cowling um, I oh, it froze up a little there. Well, looks like Norm froze up here. His internet connection must have dropped. Okay. Um, I'm just going to put him on mute here. And uh, okay, let's go on. Um, let's see. Is it, uh, I see Bill's iPad too. And I, I'm trying to remember, it was, is it Harold or no? No, Bill Day. Uh, Bill Day, okay, yeah, I'm sorry, all right. Yeah, I'm building CX-5. Uh, I was living in Maryland working for the National Archives and decided to retire. Moved down to Creek here near Seguin, Texas, uh, partly because I have a, a, an ill brother. Ah, but, okay. Uh, I had some damage in the transport of the plane, so I'll swing back, and I've got to try to figure out where the twist in it is. So I'm pulling skins and redoing everything to figure out where the twist is. I've had to reorder my uh, antennas. I was flying under uh, or close to Class B Bravo there by Washington, D.C. So I do have the, the small Echo uh, ADSB in and out tied into an NGL uh, panel. Okay. Very good. When did you start building your CX-5? Well, it's been on and off for the last three years. Now, I had okay. some help issues with I got resolved and doing better, but I'm hoping to make a lot of progress now that I'm on the air park and I have a hangar instead of a basement trying to build everything in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. Um, let's see, let's go to Peter Howe here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Morning. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I'm, I'm down in South Africa. I started oh, okay. a CX-4 about uh, five years ago. I was going to build it pretty quick, but a lot of things got in the way. And uh, I, it's, it's totally from scratch. So uh, um, I got a lot of the aluminium locally. Um, I uh, had water jet cut uh, an undercarriage leg and uh, bent it. So I hope it works. Um, and um, that's that would have saved a hell of a lot of shipping and uh the canopy is a it's a free-blown bubble okay and uh that's worked out quite well it's a friend of mine he blows up quite a lot of bubbles so you get this big ob oblong shape and it's a bit scary at first but it's worked out very nicely I, i'm using the same uh, sliding scheme except the front of the bubble is the windscreen so i've got a convex shape on my windscreen not a flat wrap and um Gotcha. That, okay. That took me quite a while. I, I think that was about two months uh, solid to get the canopy right. Um, so now the airframe is more or less complete. Um, I've just been building a jig to build the um, the engine mount, and the engine is um, 
it's a Great Plains uh, 2180 uh, that I've been building up. I haven't finished yet. Um, we're, we're in lockdown, so it's difficult to get stuff. Um, I've, um, I'm just waiting for a few taps so I can um, uh, plug all the oil galleys up. I pulled all the uh, normal plugs out and I'm putting threaded plugs in. And then I can close the motor. Um, I guess I won't be finished until the end of this year. Uh, I don't like to give uh, um, termination or end dates for my projects. This is my fifth aeroplane. I've never built an aluminium one before. It's always been wood or, or composite. Oh, okay. So I thought this should be my uh, last last one and it should be aluminium because I haven't done aluminium before. And, and it's it's actually quite interesting because there's a lot less dust. <laughs> yes. Just cut feet and, and mm -hmm. black hair. Um, but um, the, the other the other reason why I was building it, but it hasn't really worked out that way. I wanted to prove how cheaply you could build a, a little airplane for yourself. But the the problem is the exchange rates um, got so bad so rapidly that uh, it's very hard to to actually crow about that <laughs> because oh, okay. you couldn't build it as cheap as I I I built this one having started five years ago. But um, otherwise, uh, there's about there are two flying CX4s in South Africa, and there's another one with a Jabiru engine, which is, I think, almost ready to fly. Um, so perhaps there might be four of us flying. There are no CX-5s that I know of, or no, no projects starting as far as I can see. And when I spoke to um, Dave Thatcher, just before he uh, released the plans for the CX-5, we sort of discussed this and decided maybe with our dense, high density altitude, perhaps the single seater was a, a better choice. So that's why I went to CX4 and didn't wait for the five. So gotcha. we can have densities of eight and a half thousand feet on the airfield quite easily. So, oh wow, uh, yeah, so it'd be interesting to see how this pans out. <laughs> Very good, yeah, yeah, anyway. So, but I, I, I really uh, find the group quite interesting and quite often go right back into the archives looking for stuff that I remember seeing, <laughs> you know. When you're working on your own, uh, like I am, um, there's no one to really uh, talk to. So. Yeah, it's pretty useful, so, yeah. I'll uh, keep you guys in touch with my progress. Excellent, thank you, Peter. Mm. Cool, um, let's see, uh, I see Jeff is uh, wandering about there in his shop. You wanna introduce yourself, do a short introduction again? Short introduction. <clears throat> yeah, hey, hey guys, I, I'm Jeff Coffey. I'm in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. Um, I'm working on a CX-5. Um, I've got the, I, I've got, I'll just turn my computer. I've got uh, um, this, uh, the wing on the sawhorses right here is uh, ready to rivet. Um, I was just going to open that up one more time today to kind of take a last look inside and then I think maybe start pulling rivets on that today. And then the other wing over in the rack there um, is all together now. Um, uh, it just needs to be drilled up and then uh, taken apart and deburred and, and then riveted. Um, the ailerons for both wings are done too. They're under the bench. I was just working on my second fuel tank uh, most recently. I was just going to do one more um last weekend I, I i had one more leak in there that i tracked down so i was just going to do one more leak test on that today um or this weekend too i'm hoping to finish up the wings here pretty quick and then um move on to the to onto the future i'm ready to work on something different so and ben i might be i i keep uh, i've been to your website about 10 times in the last uh, couple of weeks here you know kind of trying to figure out what to order i think i'm gonna you know order the nose gear strut and just get some of those that come in handy in the use a lot here too. So I might reach cool. out to you separately about some of that. So yeah, if you have any questions, give give me a holler or whatever. And and uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, maybe one quick thing, maybe Ben, on that. It looks like you know some of those things that you're selling, like the washers and the bushings and stuff. I mean, I'm assuming that there's a little bit of a markup on that stuff, but and it's just kind of convenient yeah. to, to order it all together or. Are some of those things tough to source or? There's a couple of things that might be a little harder to source. Um, honestly, if you go to my site, if, if you want to source it locally, um, 
I would say for a lot of things, like a lot of non-aircraft nuts and bolts and specifically washers, uh, Fastenal is really good. Um, okay. That's a good resource. Um, oh, and then I was going to say, before I forget, Alan, I was talking with Alan earlier. Um, aluminum, if you're looking for just like aluminum bar, aluminum uh, angle, aluminum, sometimes aluminum sheet, man, I tell you, like aircraft spruce is fine and they're probably the best online price, but look at your local resources, look at machine shops and stuff, call around locally because man, you can get half price off of aircraft spruce's price or Wix price um, locally for some of that stuff. Anyways, okay, back to your question though, uh, Jeff. Um, yeah, so so I'm sourcing from either, I, what I'm doing is I'm buying in pretty good quantities and I do put a markup on it just because whatever, but yeah, I, what I should do is put together a kit like you said, so that you can just kind of get, buy this and these are all the washers and everything you need for the nose gear or, it's simply a time thing, so I just haven't gotten around to it. I'll take a note, though. Okay. So, but yeah. yeah. Um, uh, cool. Uh, Alan. Yeah, so that's me. Uh, I forgot I, now. Just, just really quick. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, too, I might, just because I get so little time out in the garage while we're on, I might uh, just start mute myself and start working on some things and kind of listen in and join in while I'm working stuff i hope that's okay i don't mean to be yeah rude but i love part of this but i also get so little time out here that i want to kind of take advantage of the time that i have so all right totally understood i'd be doing the same thing except for i'd have an air compressor running and a plasma table and a CNC <laughs> router and it, i wouldn't be able to hear anything so all right <laughs> anyways all right cool uh alan gideon do you want to give yourself a quick introduction here uh good morning all so um Six months ago, we moved from Virginia down to uh, northern Georgia. Um, I'm within about three weeks of retiring. Um, so that all works out. Uh, once I get into the new house in a couple of weeks and take care of all the honeydews, uh, then I'll be able to start work on the, on the CX-5. Uh, I've got, I'll have a dedicated workshop for it. Uh, that, was, that was my requirement for, one requirement for the house. Uh, aside from no stairs anymore, but uh, anyway, um, so I uh, do have one request to the group, and that is uh, if you could post online a link. If you've got if you've got an online builder's log, please post a link, or if you're using the EAA builder's log, um, let us know. Uh, yes, I've got an, a very active EAA group here. But the Thatcher build manual is, as I pointed out to Ben, is a little on the sparse side. And this is the first airplane I'm building, okay? So, um, it's, uh, my main question is one of uh, what order do you do things so you don't lock yourself out? Uh, I don't want to be in Jeff's position, ready to rivet uh, everything together and say, did I remember to test the fuel tanks? I don't know. Okay, it's that sort of thing. Okay, I, I realize um, my my background, I I uh, uh, ship designer and builder, so I'm all about uh, se work sequence, test sequence, and um, maybe, and maybe that's got me a little over nervous. I don't know. That's always possible. Uh, but if, if I could uh, see how other people did it, I, it would be a great help to me. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Harold next. Harold McCollum. Can you hear us okay? Nope, oh, you're on mute, Harold. Let me see if I can unmute you. Let's see. Okay, now you're not muted. Or, yeah. Okay, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, perfect. I can hear you, Harold. Okay, I'm down in Jacksonville, Florida, and I've got the CX-4 and uh, for those of you that uh, go on the website and see the photo, it's the one with the shark's mouth on it, camouflaged. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've uh, pretty much uh, ramrodded most of the CX-4 stuff uh, because I'm operating out of a farmer's field. And uh, I'm the one that uh, we're doing the modification to the F-11, F-12 bulkheads uh, for that rough terrain. Uh, the if I can just mention something quick on the CX-4 for those building it, is the four, uh, that back tail assembly was built mainly for uh, if you're gonna operate off of concrete. Uh, 
uh, or an asphalt field. Uh, if you're going to operate off of a grass strip, you need to do some modifications to that tail assembly. Uh, but my background is uh, been an aircraft mechanic all my life, A and P, and an instructor, and also airline pilot. And uh, I caught up with my CX4 uh, with uh, a gentleman. I bought it off of him. He was in hospice at home, and I towed it home and. Uh, finished the build on it and took it through the DAR and everything uh, and uh, pretty much it. Very good. Thanks, Harold. Anytime. All right, cool. Uh, I see Greg uh, Mexon here. You want to go next? Yeah, I'm, uh, I was just trying to get my video going. Um, I'm, this is kind of crazy. I had a chance through a local foundation to fly down to Alabama to pick up an L39. I've never ridden in a Citation before. So, um, hey, I just got, um, it was kind of crazy day yesterday. I just got, um, you know, that email from EAA about Oshkosh being canceled and then the UPS guy delivers the CX-7 plans uh, later that day. So it turned out to be a good day. So, uh, so that's just in its infancy. Um, I've, contacted Ed Kalifas about the engine mount. Um, you know, I'm just getting going, just barely getting going. So uh, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Sounds good, thanks, Greg. Uh, let's see, uh, next I see, uh, must be a dial in from a phone. It says SMG900V. I don't know who, who that is here. Can you hear me, Dan? I think that might be me, Mark. Okay, I can hear you. I can hear Martin. Um, I see Martin separately, though. Oh, not me. But that's my or my. Is that phone. your phone? Did you dial in and connect via the app or something? Getting some background noise of airplanes. So, which is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm not complaining. Yeah, the the number password wasn't working, but the Thatcher worked both on my phone and online. Okay, good. Good deal. Well, I'm glad to have you here. Well, yeah, Martin, if you want to just give your over your bio, your short bio. Yeah, uh, I live in La Crosse, Wisconsin. So that's uh, bummed out about Oshkosh like everybody else. Uh, started with CX-4, uh, plans number eight and 04. And then I'm switching to the five. And um, if anybody's got more things to talk about uh, Revmaster. I'd like to talk to more Revmaster guys, but I uh, haven't bought the engine yet, but uh, got the cowling canopy and working on some of the airframe stuff. Cool. Good deal, Martin. I see, I see Greg got his video going inside of a citation. Is that right? <laughs> well, that's cool. Um, cool. Yeah, Thanks, it Martin. is crazy <laughs> deal all right let's see let's go to uh i see um sean's on again uh here today sean do you want to introduce yourself to the group again hey uh yeah i'm uh over here in sacramento california uh building a cx5 i uh am in the process of closing out the wing stubs on a few slides uh so uh slow and steady progress here um yeah, that's pretty much about it. Good deal. Thanks. Thanks for joining again. I see Bert Beerman's on. Haven't seen you for a while, Bert. How's it going? Hope you're muted right now. So let me see, see, see if we can get you off of mute. There you go. Yeah, Let's try. I'm off mute. Oh, we got some feedback though. It takes me a while. Ooh, I'm getting feedback. Hold on. Oh, uh. There. Are you okay. Is it better? Yeah. Yeah, that's I'm, better. Yeah, when you have two devices, it's not, it's not, oops. Hang on a minute. I can hear you just fine. Yeah, and I can see you now. It's great. We're good. Good deal. Uh, you wanted me to introduce myself. I'm Bert Bierman. I'm out of St. Charles, Missouri. I fly out of uh, KSET, St. Charles County Airport. I'm building the uh, CX-5 serial number 93, and 
I've been on a little bit of a hiatus here with the, uh, the virus, but uh, I'll be getting back on it quick. And things are going along good. I'm, I'm working on the vents to bring them into the wing and then into the cockpit. So that's kind of a mind bender to do that. <laughs> uh, I've built a couple airplanes before and a gyrocopter and uh, I've got to get this uh, fixed up. I've, I've got the wings built, the fuselage is built. You, you pretty, it's pretty much the way you saw it. Back in September. Okay, cool. Good deal. Yeah, Bert was kind enough to, um, we, um, my dad and my son and I went down to uh, the Zenith Open Hangar Days in September down in Mexico, Missouri, and we shot down to visit Bert. So he invited us in for a few hours and checked out his CX-5. And yeah, it was very good progress. Very nice, uh, some nice uh, uh, custom tweaks to it. And yeah, it's pretty, yeah. pretty great time. So good yeah, to get to that. It's always good well, to that, meet people in person. So. That's where I'm at now. Okay. Very good. Cool. So I think that's everybody. Uh, I think everybody said hi. Um, so I didn't really have too much of an agenda today. I just kind of want, you know, figured we'd say hi and introduce ourselves. And uh, um, I, uh, I did want to go back to Peter uh, while you're on, if, if you don't mind, Peter. So you, you've built composite, you built wood, and now you're building aluminum. So what, like, compare, contrast, what do you think of those three? Like, what's good, bad, otherwise? You know, with, uh, with, with wood, you can make mistakes and get away with it. With composite, you can hide everything. With metal, you can't. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's more of a challenge because you just can't make any errors. And uh, um, I think that uh, also probably metal is probably the lightest way you can build an aeroplane. Um, if this had been a composite airplane, it would, would have been heavier. Uh, I'm enjoying it. I think that uh, uh, probably for a first time builder, metal is, is probably the best choice. And, um, and I think that uh, you, you can move along much faster. Obviously, if you've got a composite kit, um, things would be all pre-molded, et cetera, but then it wouldn't have been a project. <laughs> right, so, right. Uh, it's, I, I'm enjoying the, the aluminium. Um, I I don't think I want to build another one. I'm 73 now, so I think this is my last. Um, and uh, I think also for VW-powered aeroplane, um, for for hot and high, a an aluminium single seater like the Satcher is probably a good choice. Um, It'd be interesting if someone did build a, a, a CX-5 just to see how it would go here with, with 80 horsepower. Um, and the, on the motor side, I've, I haven't actually built a complete VW before. And um, I'm finding the Great Plains kit, which I bought five years ago, a bit of a challenge. Okay. Um, and uh, it's, I, I decided to build the engine myself because I thought that it's a good way to learn about the engine. You know, you're going to know it really well as again, right. buying it ready to go. Um, so I've learned a hell of a lot about uh, um, VW motors for airplanes. Um, I think that the engine is not that optimized um, from what I can see. So maybe uh, Revmaster's d perhaps done a better job. Um, I, um, I struggle with some of the parts. Um, if anybody's built VWs before, um, things like the deck height isn't right. So I haven't got the right spaces. So now I'm trying to sc scratch around for spaces to go into the cylinders and stuff like that. I'll get there. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. And, uh, is it? Um, it's. I, I've not built a VW before either, but I've built several, uh, about probably about twenty motorcycle engines and. Um, a handful of car motors. Um, you talk about the deck height. What? Uh, so, so obviously, you use, it's from the center line of the crankshaft to the to the um, top of the, or the, I guess it'd be the, where the cylinder head mounts, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mostly, so, what happens is the the VW guys when they talk about deck height, they sort of um, actually refer to the difference between the top of the cylinder and the top of the piston. They don't really give you or talk about the oh. distance from the the block to the top of the cylinder uh, so 
Oh, oh, so you're talking about like how much compression you're getting or your your um, cylinder volume or whatever. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, we've okay. got to get the compression right. And, um, yeah. you know, I didn't want to go over eight to one because our, our um, automotive fuel here is 95 octane. So um, eight to one is maximum. And uh, to, to, you've got to uh, basically um, look at the deck height and the cylinder volume and the stroke. <laughs> and you end up with a compression ratio and uh, I was going to end up with a 9 to 1 compression ratio which wouldn't have been much good I think for a VW okay. so I've got a few hiccups like that and um, uh, I, I think um, a kit built engine would be a good choice I think for anybody living in the US but when you live this far away if there's something missing or not quite right it's, it's a bit of a hiccup yeah. so uh, um, I, I would recommend anybody living outside the U.S. maybe to buy a completed tested motor, not a kit. Um, but uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, and then um, one of the guys talked about the, the, uh, the tail uh, damage um, on a bumpy airfield. I've, um, I've sort of looked at this and, you know, I think it's a, a question of, of twist of the, of, the, of the tail wheel leaf spring and also it's bending forces on, on those two bulkheads. I'm going to try another route. I'm going, I've had a, I had a kit box that I built the years before and I had a broken tail spring and I always remember that. You know, if you're in the middle of nowhere with a broken tail spring, it's hard to get home. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to do a glass fiber one. Um, okay. uh, so uh, I, I built a, a, a yacht some years ago and I've got some batten material over that I built up unidirectional. It's about an inch wide or inch and a quarter and about uh, I guess about five sixteen thick and um, I'm going to do a, a glass fibers tail spring and um, and see if I can take away those forces onto those two bulkheads and see how it goes. I'm also trying to uh, increase the angle of attack of the, of the main wing for landing, um, I I uh, I don't want to have to use a very long runway. I want to get near the stall on 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 touchdown. So I'm going to lower the uh, tail as low as I dare, uh, still keeping rudder clearance, and I've increased the undercarriage leg height slightly, about two inches. So we'll see where where it goes. Um, where where I live, I live in the middle of the country, and. Uh, if you have an engine failure or so, you need to get down into a pretty short, short patch. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's one of my rationales for that. What, uh, Peter, what city do you live in, if you don't mind me asking? Well, I live in a small town called Harip Dam, G-A-R-I-E-P. If you Google that on uh, Google Earth, uh, you'll, you'll pick it up. It's the biggest dam in the, in the country. And uh, the town's got a small airport, but I, I uh, operate out of a, a farm strip about 10 miles to the, to the east, to the west. I've got a, a self-launching glider there that I fly out of there. Oh, very so, cool. Uh, okay. Real farm strip. You said, your you said your density altitude can get really high. What, what's, the, what's the airport altitude? What's the... Where, where, where we are, my strip is 4,000 feet, and I can have oh. uh, 40 degrees centigrade um, fairly often in summer. So okay. it means, and, and that's, not, that's not the highest um, density altitude. You could probably have higher in some parts of the country, so you have to be a little bit careful. Um, yeah. Okay. You know, we use, usually the, the uh, visitors to the country aren't used to it. <laughs> People come to tour around the country in airplanes. They they've got to learn quickly about densities. Yeah, I bet. Huh. Yeah. Um, continuing on your talk about the engines, uh, somebody else had a, some questions about Revmaster. Um, was that Martin or I can't remember who that was? Somebody asked if we could talk about that. Make sure you're uh, unmuted if you're. If you had questions uh, about hey, that. This is Norm. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Hey, Norm. Welcome yeah. back. Sorry, we lost. Yeah, you. I dropped out. I had a, I have an old laptop and bad battery, and it dropped out because I didn't realize I didn't have it plugged in. Um, yeah, he wanted to talk about Revmaster. I heard a little bit about that. Um, 
I'm uh, based upon what I've heard and read and talked to Joe Horvath about. I'm I'm pretty confident um, in the reliability of my Revmaster, and also based upon Bill's um, um, comments. You know, he's uh, about the 2300. It sounds like he's really happy with it. Um, we I we talk, started talking about people with questions about the Revmaster. That was me last week, but um, I think I don't know if you guys saw that mm -hmm. about elastic about the elastic uh, nuts being authorized by um, Bill, by um, Joe Horvath. But anyway, yeah. I, was so it, it sounds I, like they're, I, not, they're not like a nylon, though. They aren't like a plastic nut. It sounds like they're a fi fiber washer or something. They're a little different. Sounded. Yeah, I guess so. Um, it looks like a standard um, fiber lock nut, except it's blue. Um, I don't know if it means anything. But based upon what Joe said and what his, his reputation, I'm, I'm going ahead with the project with the engine the way it is. Sure. And he even said that once, uh, when I'm ready to start it, he'll, uh, he'll, he said, give him a call and we'll talk about uh, the data that I should be seeing um, on initial startup. Okay. Well, that's cool. It sounds like you're getting support for, uh, for your engine. So that's good. Which carburetor uh, are you using? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I was going to, I'm using a Zenith carburetor. Um, I apologize to those of you who heard about my story on it last week and have to hear it again, but. Um, two things, yeah, I'm using a Zenith carburetor, the one I bought from uh, Great Plains Aircraft that's um, for the, this larger engine. Um, I also wanted to say something, um, a nod to Peter, is uh, one reason I'm going with the Revmaster, besides the fact that it was the one that's on the prototype, is that it's only three hours away from me. So if I have any questions or concerns, I can just drive down there if I had to. Yeah, this is Martin again. Uh, when Steve was still with us, uh, I know Peter couldn't call from South Africa, but he Steve put out a video years ago that was really good step by step on how to assemble his you know engines or any other VW engines, and that might if you could find a copy of that, uh, help Peter out. Uh, my problem with Revmaster is. Uh, you know, the carb Martin, you kind of broke up there. Um, can you say uh, that again? You said your problem with the Revmaster is the... Well, we was uh, trying to talk with Joel about a year ago, and I talked to Glenn at, during, and every time I talked to him, I either got pushed back or I got totally different pricing on how much to drop the uh, Revmaster carb and go with the mechanical fuel pump. And I didn't want to do it at all. And I just got a lot of pushback. And if anybody else is having issues, or maybe everybody isn't worrying about it. But uh... yeah, I, I don't personally have experience with the Rubmaster. Um, does anybody else have uh, I'm trying to think, Bert, did you have a Revmaster on yours? Is your is a great planes built? I thought you had a Revmaster. Yeah, I got the the Revmaster and the Revflow carburetor. I had sent the the uh pump mm -hmm. put, they have them put the uh put the uh engine oil pump onto the uh the front of the engine. And I didn't have any problems doing that. Just it's just I had a little clearance problem when I got it back, but it uh, I had a little clearance problem between the the, the uh, oil pump and and the chip, the crankcase. But I, I fixed that up. Everything's fine. Uh, we'll see how it runs. Yeah, uh, my engine came with a RevFlow um, carburetor on it. I just took it off and put it in a shelf. It seemed like uh, just he's pushing it. I, I think I have a room full of those um, carburetors. So they're just pushing it. Um, for me, it's just an extra piece of um, equipment and or a historical piece for the future. I'm not sure. I just have one, but I'm replacing it with the Zenith. Yeah, I've, I've run both carburetors, the RevFlow and the Zenith. Um, I've had good luck with both. Uh, I mean, well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that this will work fine. 
but uh, I've, I've used the Zenith before with a half EW, and I flew it 800 hours, so it should be good. Nice. Does that help Martin, or any other questions around the Revmaster? Or? What I had suggested to Glenn, I, I wish he was on because I haven't talked to him for a while, but was as between him and Dave, if they could get together with Revmaster and come up with a package price for the five and seven builders. So it's like, okay, it's this much money for his engine with the, carb, with the Zenith carb or without the Zenith carb and with the mechanical pump. So everybody doesn't have to call in and negotiate with, with Joel. Yeah, kind of a firewall forward quasi right. package sort of, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that'd probably be in, um, probably, um, yeah, I'll have to talk to Dave and kind of see, but I think that would probably fall into my purview for doing something like that. Um, yeah, at this point, I'm not prepared to really get into stocking or really working through all the engine parts, um, hopefully in the next year or so. Um, kind of depends on time and money. So, But yeah, no, I think that kind of like uh, like Jeff was saying about the nose gear kit, you know, the, the more kitted, grouped, and documented, well-documented, um, you know, things we can put together, you know, Dave or myself or Glenn, it's just going to be easier for people. It'll be simpler. Um, you don't have to hunt and hunt around trying to figure out what, uh, what you need. So, um, yeah, I, I think Martin, that's a great suggestion. Um, time and money. <laughs> so. Cool. Anybody else have uh, pressing issues or questions or we got the brain trust here. So. Yeah, Ben, I was just kind of curious about just from your perspective, kind of running a business related to this, like, is the is the community growing right now? I mean, is it, is it pretty, there's kind of us that are out there, the handful of us that are out there, or I mean, how much interest ha and demand have you been seeing? Or like so, before? yeah, so, so going back to when I, when I first talked with Greg Westbury about, about, you know, buying his business, uh, for manufacturing, you know, I looked at his books and, and, uh, and, you know, it was, he was doing a decent business. It w wouldn't have been enough to, you know, live on for me, but it would have been, you know, okay. Um, and I think what, what kind of killed some of that was the CX-5 and CX-7 announcements right after that, right? So um, I think a lot of people said, whoa, I'm going to hold on and wait until the CX-7 is available or what, whatever. So so I think when I when I took on this business, some some the business I was expecting didn't really materialize. Um, so that was a little disappointing. Uh, you know, obviously I have a lot of money into equipment and, and a lot of time into uh, getting things put into CAD and stuff. On the other hand, um, yeah, things are picking up. Um, not incredibly, but I mean, I, I guess I was going through and doing some things uh, for uh, the, I think I told, told some of you anyways, I had, I had uh, EA had offered up some, um, booth space for uh, new designs and new products. And so I'd put in, it was basically there's a pitch your, your product or your design. And if they like it, they'll give you a free booth space, which, you know, for me would save me five to $8,000. You know, that's, that's a good, that was a good chunk. So, so anyways, um, so I put in for that. Well, one of the things I had to do is go back through and look at my, my growth. And so I'm seeing about for the last, like, I've still only been doing it about just over two years but it's about 300% year over year, which is decent. Like this year now, if things keep going about how they have been, I expect this year will be about as good as what I expected my first year to be. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, so it's fine. It's, um, you know, I can't quit my day job yet, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's getting there. So um, I think the other thing is that's holding me back is I'm not offering as many um, kits as Greg uh, was um, just basically I had bought his, uh, his CAD uh, programs or his CAD um, layouts, but he was using a different version of CAD that is not available. Like you simply can't buy the software anymore. Um, so I'm unable to open those files, a lot of them. Some of them were done in SolidWorks. Uh, some of them he had DXF files. Everything he had the, the tap files for his CNC machines, but my machine doesn't read those accurately. So, um, so I, I have about, maybe five to 10% of what he did um, is usable. Um, a lot of it's CX4 stuff. So I have like, I have a tail kit match drilled sitting out in my shop waiting to 
for me to have time to actually bend a few things and try and rivet it together, verify the dimensions, and then I'll have a, a tail kit uh, available for the CX4, that, that kind of thing. So I have a lot of, I have a, I have a lot of irons in the fire. So I feel like I just kind of jumped in the fire with all my irons. So, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, it's going. Um, I think every time I offer something new, it seems like that's, it's, it's good. Um, and the thing I'm really trying to do is, is I'm trying to pull my prices back a little bit. I know like, like Norm and um, Sean have bought some rib kits for me and it just like, it's, it's hard for me to ask the price that I'm asking, but it's what I kind of have to right now for materials cost and time cost. Um, there's a few pieces of, of equipment that I've purchased um, that will hopefully make those a little more affordable. Um, sure. But yeah, so so anyways, um, but yeah, hopefully just just keep plugging away and offering more things to make it life easier. But um, I also yeah. got this. Oh, I almost knocked my coffee over. I got this guy, um, which is uh, a new camera that I'm I'm taking photos and videos of the CX7 uh, assembly process so that hopefully I can then put that out as either a video series or a photo kind of a, a supplementary to the builder's manual for the CX-7 and then I'll continue doing that with the the four and the five parts as I'm making those parts and kits so um so hopefully I'll, it'll just make the builder's manual more fully formed um because I know that I mean you know I, I look at it and there's a lot of there's a lot of gaps um I'm, I'm working on the the um fuselage right now for the seven and you know i have okay fuselage construction okay there we go so i go from here to here and then the next is like a complete assembled fuselage with the center section and it's like whoa where how did we get there it's kind of quick so um so yeah it'd be nice to have the intermediate steps and some you know some more dimension things um oh and i think alan you were talking about drilling your spars um yes. I, I have so i have the cat all done on that um i have some um i can probably i i need to think about this but i think i can offer um a dimension drawing for some of like the the intercostal holes and that sort of thing that might save you from misdrilling things or that sort of thing um i'm trying to make sure i'm i'm, I'm trying to have a business here so i do want to make sure i'm not you know putting myself out of business but i also you know want to help so i think i can give you a dimension drawing here probably in the next few days for the intercostal holes so that you can make sure that you're not putting rivet holes in those spots and that sort of thing um might just save you a little material and uh from misdrilling that sort of thing um but uh because because the, the the blueprints are there's some there's some things there that are a little bit um hard to track down so so, so my earlier comment on uh, looking for other people's build logs or whatever, I figure I'm going to make enough of my own mistakes. I'd rather not repeat the mistakes of other people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know Sean has a good um, builder's log out there um, that I follow from time to time, um, kind of keep track of that a little bit. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, Alan, I think you'd ask everybody to uh, post up their builder's log. Um, I'd really like to have that up on either Dave's site or my site or community site or something. Um, I I can only manage my site, but uh, but that and just the general knowledge base. Um, I just I really need to get my software updated to a, a new platform so I have that ability. Um, but I just saw somebody named Glenn. Looks like he popped on here. So good morning, Glenn. Is that uh, Glenn Bradley or another Glenn? And you're on mute. Let me unmute you. Glenn, is that you? Glenn, can you hear us okay? Or well, I'll take that as a as a no. So okay. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> moving on. Um so Can I say something? Yeah, yeah. Norm, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I try not to interject too much because I'll stop everybody but uh, a couple things i was going to ask the question last week concerning websites and sharing information um but then i held myself back and said i'll, I'll wait for everybody to figure out basically i would appreciate any advice or opinions on where which sites if any we should be posting information and questions because some forums are more appropriate than others for example build questions are probably more appropriate for certain forums 
for the builders and as opposed to just some of those people that are just sort of interested in the um, in the airplane um, the other thing about is, is about the hesitancy to share information is like I, I don't want to I'm kind of embarrassed to show all my mistakes I mean I'll tell you right now I'm I'm re basically building two airplanes because I'll make a mistake and then I have to redo it all over again um, and the last thing I want to say on that um, and this is a big one, and I didn't think I was going to tell you guys this because I'm embarrassed about it. Don't make my mistake. I cracked my acrylic canopy. Oh, I, had it I was very, very careful for four straight days. I treated it like, like it was precious. But by the fourth day, and I'm, I'm, I'm where I'm at last, um, where, right now, I thought, oh, this is great. This is coming together to get great. Well, I, there was a stress crack, and before I realized it, it was 10 inches long. So what I'm going to do is I stop drilled it and I'm going to probably be kind of sneaky and I'm probably going to add a um, metal or some kind of strip to make it look like it was meant to be there, like some sort of cosmetic um, thing to make it look like maybe it's a two-part canopy and, mm -hmm. um, and go with it. And the thing is, is that I plan on just flying the, getting this thing flying and then worrying about the cosmetics later. If I'm really unhappy with the situation, I'll just replace the canopy after phase one um, while it's getting painted. And, and I'm bringing this up along with, uh, I forgot the person, I'm sorry, I'm bad with names and forgot who it was. Um, uh, I would appreciate too if, if, we, if we were able to see each other's work and see what work went wrong or you know, what, how to do something. I'll tell you, almost every day I'm looking at that video, um, uh, the CX-5 close-up video just to see exactly how they where they put the, the weather stripping or the trim and you know, where how how some how you just basically to see how they built the plane and um, and I took a lot of pictures of Rob Flood's plane the guy in Arizona when I went to Sun and Fun and saw his plane I took pictures all over the plane to kind of get an idea of what he did and the problem with that it's not a problem but basically the truth is is that they're two very different planes. Um, and what you'll see is that as plans builders, what we're doing is we're making a lot of changes or having not been told exactly how to do it, we're making it work. An example, for example, is with the canopy on the prototype, it looks like the top of it is flush with the turtle deck. Whereas if you take a look, a close look at Rob Flood's plane in Arizona, he actually had the, the, the back of the canopy sitting on top of his turtle deck just slightly. Um, that's just a small example of how you're going to see changes throughout the airplane. And because of his Revmaster um, um, injector carb, he actually had to take the, the canopy that he bought and modify it heavily. And another thing you'll see, and I don't want to embarrass the guy, is if you take a look at his build photos, you'll see that he made a large gap in his canopy because he cut it wrong the first time. And so then he had to put extended um, pieces of metal from his uh, instrument panel back to cover up the hole that he made. So anyway, what I'm getting at, and I'm kind of rambling now, is um, need advice on where you want us to post or where it's, where it's, what's appropriate for us, where it's, it's appropriate for us to post those kinds of things. And also, I agree that, you know, it'd be great. Um, and I'm sharing with you my problems and my mistakes, because maybe the rest of you guys won't make the same mistake. Thank you. Yeah, understood. Hey, I'll tell you, I'll share my, uh, my mistake of the week. Okay, so, so I'm working on the CX-7, right? And so the, the process that I go through to, um, to take the, the hand-drawn plans that Dave gives uh, to us, because I have those exact same plans that anyone else who orders the CX-7 does. Um, so the process I take is I take the, uh, the full-size plans, take them to my local office supply store, and have them scanned in at full dimension. Um, I then, when I get home, I take a tape measure, ruler, whatever, and verify the um the dimensions um uh, of the hand-drawn plans and let's see, let me back up uh, i take the scans then uh, load them on my computer i pull the, the scanned uh image up into my cad program and then there's a thing called calibrate so i can say from this point of the image to that point of the image is 10 inches or 20 inches or whatever so what i do is i go to my the, the plans that dave sends that say full size drawing to find a dimension and match that up in my CAD program. So basically I've now dimensioned it appropriately inside of CAD, right? So, uh, and then I, from there, go ahead and, you know, draw the, the rest of the, the uh, 
piece up and, and uh, I'll go through the process of bringing it into cam and, and manufacturing it. My mistake this week, and I've never done this before, somehow I messed up the firewall. So if you follow in my Instagram, the Stature Aircraft on Instagram, you'll see on Monday, I don't think it was Sunday or Monday, I, I was like, woohoo, I got my firewall cut out, you know, the galvanized, whatever. And I'm, I'm holding this thing, I'm going, man, this is gonna be a big plane. Like this is gonna be so comfortable to sit in because this thing's big, but all right, whatever, that's fine. And you can probably see where I'm going with this. So I, uh, I ended up um, making it about uh, a third larger, <laughs> like a 30% larger. So I have like a firewall for like a six seat airplane. <laughs> yeah, it's like 40, I think 44 or 45 inches wide when it's supposed to be 32 or something. So I actually ended up cutting the actual firewall out of that piece. But yeah, I'm like, I started I, like, I'm getting things fitted up and like start measuring. I'm like, this is way off. What went wrong? And I went back into my CAD and yeah, I scaled it wrong somehow. I had calibrated it and just, yeah, not it's right. A lot better than making it smaller. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I was able to reuse, but I had formed it and everything. I made my form blocks. I did it. Yeah. So yeah, Norm, you're not the only one. I mean, granted, my mistake is a little less expensive than yours, but yeah, it, it, it happens. So, um, but. And, and one more thing, um, one of the things I wanted to bring up concerning the request or the need for a construction manual is, um, I, I have the plans and the construction manual for the Bowers fly baby. Cause I thought about building that a couple years back. Yeah. And if you look at that, that is what I would love to see for any of the factual products. Okay. So, but what I think the issue is, and what hopefully will happen is, is if this becomes a watershed aircraft design where people love it and people are building it all over the country and the world, then someone will take the time to, you know, go through every step and, and in sequence and recommendations on what you should do first and, and where to source things. Because that's what the Bowers Fly Baby um, construction manual and, and plans have. Actually, it doesn't have plans. It just has a construction manual. And um, right. if anyone ever wanted to try to do something like that for one of the Thatcher designs, I would use the Bowers Fly Baby um, construction manual as a guide. What, one yeah. caveat on that, that was done back in the 60s. So a lot of the information is old as far as sourcing. But, um, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's what I would love to see. Um, so, so, so uh, Norm, anyway. I totally agree with you. I was just going to show this. I have it sitting right next to my desk here. This is my Bearhawk patrol plans. That was one airplane, airplane I had considered before I heard about the Thatcher, okay? That's the builder's manual. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I totally get it. it uh, this was actually done by a different guy. I can't, I want to say it's Eric something. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's just a, it's a full on, like every little piece of everything, words, pictures. And I mean, there's three, three big volumes on that. So yeah, th there's, there is major room for improvement. Um, I mean, the things that I see like building this fuselage, like building this, the wings, you really can only do at least the spars, ribs, some of that one way. You have to build the spars, you have, you know. But, um, but like for the fuselage, so far, what I've seen is in the photos, in the builder's guide, it's different from the plans in some places. There's a few, like, or it's not real clear. Like, do I overlap, you know, does this angle bolt up here or does that go here or how does, you know, so it's, there's a little bit of, there's room for confusion. And anytime you have to sit there for 15 minutes and look at it and think about it, that's 15 right. minutes you didn't spend actually building it. So I'm trying, that's why I'm trying to document I'd like to offer some advice for those people that are starting this build or haven't started yet is don't get in too big of a hurry to, to build or make allowances for, um, for the future. What I'm getting at is like, don't pre-cut the whole, for example, don't pre-cut the hole for the access cover for your battery until you actually put it up against the plane. And the, 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 um, it sounds weird, but let me tell you what happened to me is I, I had the piece and I measured according to the, pl uh, the plans where it should go and I cut the hole for it and then I, once I put it on the airplane I realized that the hole was covering a piece of um, angle so that I had to start all over and move the cover down a little bit but basically I wasted a piece of aluminum 
And I don't know if it was me interpreting the plans wrong or if the plans are slightly incorrect. Um, the same thing happened, and I told you about this, Ben, on when I built the nose, the nose wheel framing. So it seems like my I put the hole just slightly off from where it should be, but I thought I was following the plans. So what I'm getting at is back to the people that um, are just starting is, is don't pre-make a lot of things because you might find out that once you put it on your juice lodge or your airframe that it doesn't fit right. So um, that's my advice. So for example, I'm not going to build the fuel tanks before I build the wings because I can just see putting it in there and realizing that it might be just a slightly a, a bit too tall or something like that. That's an example of why I'm gonna wait and just until I have the assembly together that it's gonna fit in, then build what goes in it. So anyway, that's my word of advice um, to prevent a lot of problems in the future. Right, yeah. No, well, I think this, this is Bert in yeah. St. Louis. Uh, I'd like to comment on the fact that uh, putting the, going to, according to the plans and then having a, a pre-built spar center section, the holes were already in the center section and when I used the plans for the rest of the build, it, using their dimensions, when I went to join it up to the to the to the spar, the hole was uh, let's say an, a quarter inch off, because uh, Greg built it a certain way, and then <clears throat> but the plans were a little different. That's all I'm getting at. Um, and so I just learned to adapt to all these things. And like he was just saying, like Norman was just saying, if you Go by the plans and pre-cut something. It often doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I think I think um, it's a good idea to um, make sure you're working in one subsection and fit things up and double check. The, I mean, obviously, I'm converting everything into CAD. So as I'm doing that, uh, sorry, I have I have monitors stacked here, and my my uh, camera's right in the middle. So if it looks like I'm looking <laughs> up, um, right. I was going to clear up my CAD program so I can share my screen, and you guys can look at what. Uh, <clears throat> look at what um, these uh, uh, spars um, we were talking about some spar stuff but but yeah the the um, the plans sometimes are they might be off um, you know a lot of stack up issues where it's off by a 16th of an inch an eighth of an inch um, you know I haven't seen too much more than about an eighth maybe a couple spots of three eighths of an inch which is kind of considerable but um, anyways um, there's uh, there's definitely some things where you, you just kind of Use your, you know, you got to think through, you got to match it up, sleep, you know, go to sleep early that night because sometimes just sleeping on it's a good idea. Um, Having a yeah, lot of patience. <laughs> yeah, a lot of patience. Um, yeah. Let me... on, on the spars, not, uh, I guess I've been curious is they've been promoting the guys who want to build sevens to go ahead and build, start building the wings on the five. But if you build the spar complete with the center section and drill the uh, attach points, how can you use those outer panels on a seven if they've already been drilled for the you, center section on a five? So Martin, you can't use a center section from a five for a seven. It's too narrow. Right. So right. yeah, you can only use I, the, yeah. Um, so that, that was, Dave made that very clear early on. You can build the, the wings and the tail, but not the center section. Um, so then they're not drilling. How, Okay, so they're they're not drilling the outer wing attach until later. I guess I I can't see how you right. can drill the center section on the seven when you got a complete panel done. That would be really a pain to do. Um, to get to dihedral and everything. I mean, I, yeah, I, I okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so if you have a if you have a wing sitting on your bench. And you're trying to put the center section onto it with that seven se seven inch lift or whatever. It was a six or seven at the wingtip. Um, trying to remember. Anyways, um, here let me share my screen here because this is what we're talking about. Let me. I'm going to try and share this. I think this is the right window. Tell me if this is wrong. Um, oh, okay. I just had to got a different MacBook Pro here. So hang on. Uh, okay, yeah, I guess I can't. I'm sorry, I can't share right now. Um, um, uh, I'm sorry, I got a different MacBook Pro and it won't. Um, I have to stop Ring Central and restart in order to get it to share. Um, but, anyways, yeah, so, so Martin, your question. Um, so, anybody who hasn't built one of these or, or is talking about what Martin's talking about is the 
center section spar is, uh, let me drag this down so it doesn't look like I'm, okay. Um, center section spar is just a flat spar, right? And what Martin's talking about is the wings, they have a dihedral, right? So they're raised, I think it's seven inches or something at the wing tip off the bench. So if you laid the center section flat on the bench, the wing tip needs to be up. Um, I think what I do is I just reverse that and leave the wing flat and um, recalculate that seven inch dimension so you could get your center section up, I guess. Um, the other, th I mean, <laughs> I, like I said, I'm kind of doing everything in a CAD. So I like, I just have accurate dimensions on all my parts. And so I like, I just, I make the parts to be, to have the proper dihedral. And so when I'm done, when I bolt it together, it just, it just is right. Um, and that's something that unfortunately a home builder isn't going to have the same ability. Uh, but, but I mean, it's a pretty straightforward geometric calculation, I believe, to, uh, to figure that out. Um, let me, let me do this. Those of you who have built your, um, your own spars, how have you done the, uh, how have you set the dihedral? On the bench. Sure. Yeah, Jeff, I think. Uh, yeah, I've done, I drilled mine. Um, I was actually, I just hit the same snake you did, Ben. I was going to try to share my screen and so show some photos of when I drilled mine up. Um, but I need to restart to give it the right security <laughs> settings here on my Mac. But yeah, you see um, my screen but yeah I, I mean, I, I hear, I forget who asked that question. I mean, I think it would be much more of a pain to do it with the whole wing panel assembled than just drilling up the spark alone. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, Norman's got, he's showing us some good stuff there. Yeah, Norm has his, uh, has his spar right up there on the screen. So let's see this, Norm. Take yourself off mute and let's uh, tell us what you're doing here. So this is the starboard side of uh, my my wing. You can see there; these are the attached bolts, the holes for the um, on the on the center piece. This is a piece of hardwood that I use to make sure that um, that this doesn't get damaged or whatever. And the anyway, and here's the um, the holes in the wing spar. So as you guys can see, what he's talking about is making sure that the holes are set up where they need to be so that you have the proper dihedral in your wing. And I think what the point is, is that you can work on this part, the wings, but don't work on this until you have the plans for the seven. And I guess the problem would be, the only issue would be, once you get this together, drilling the holes where they need to be so that it's at the right dihedral. So, right, is that what we're talking about? Exactly. Yeah, the Martin's question was, you know, you have a completed wing and now you're trying to drill those holes. Like how that's not really easy. And I totally agree that that would be a major pain. So um Yeah. The other, yeah. The other sure it can be done, but it's you know, you'd have to have some engineering in it and build right. a nice gig or have your friends help you, but it is possible. Yeah. Hey Norm, so you, you built your spar, right? And I think Jeff did too. Did you guys uh you just bucked the rivets or did you Buck. use a T frame press or did you guys I mean, a lot of people ask, like, I'd love to sell people spars, but honestly, like, they're, they're pretty straightforward to do. There's a lot of measuring and a lot of holes, but they're pretty straightforward, I think. So I, I wish Dave would not have put that note in the CX-5 manual. I know he was trying to push business towards Greg, but I think he may have scared people off because he's got that, you know, if you're not a mechanic, don't do the spars, buy them or have a mechanic do it or whatever. And... Yeah built one of the first RV4s where Van sent you a bunch of strips of aluminum and said, go for it. <laughs> so it's not that hard. It's yeah. time consuming. It's boring. You know, each spar cap on a four is like 85 holes. So you got four times that just to do the spars plus the center. But it's not hard. It's just a lot of drilling. Yeah. And, um, Van used to rent a pneumatic squeezer. Hmm. And when one builder would get done, you would uh, send it on to the next builder on the list. And when I came time to get mine, the guy was like in North Dakota, sent it to me. So I got done with it. The next guy on the list was in Anchorage, Alaska. 
So gotcha. my, yeah. price, my, my price of the rental was to ship it to Alaska. But I mean, if nothing yeah. else, you know, maybe we can set something up like that where, you know, we have a, a community pneumatic squeezer. That's what I use. You know, I, you know, I'll reference. offer this up. If any of you guys, so I have a pneumatic squeezer and it, it's just the cat's meow. Like it just works. If any of you guys want to come out here and squeeze your spars together, even if you didn't buy anything from me, you're more than welcome to. I mean, I, I would only put the caveat on this, contact me in advance and, and that sort of thing, but you're welcome to use it. I can't ship it around because I need it, but um, but yeah, that's a good point, Martin. The other thing I'm going to put out is, um, I've thought about this a little bit. I have So my form blocks that I use for the uh, wing ribs and eventually for the fuselage bulkheads or whatever, um, I've been trying to figure out what a good way of doing that because right now I have like on my site, I have a kit that you can buy with preformed ribs and that's a uh, few people have bought those from me. Um, and that's, that's great. I, I mean, basically the difference in price, I, I just pay my dad for actually forming the thing. So, um, and eventually it'll, you know, it'll go to our, the, the, um, the hydraulic press that we just picked up. But, um, but anyways, the, uh, the form blocks though, um, I think that that would be something some people have asked about that. Hey, can you, you know, I think it was recently, even this week, uh, CX4 form blocks, like, Hey, can somebody, does anybody have these use them once and you're done? Right. So, um, the only, the only caveat there is my form blocks, um, the, the holes for the location pins aren't going to match up with Dave's plans. And there's a couple of reasons for that, which I won't get into, but, um, otherwise they're basically identical. Um, so, if you know, basically, if you if you want to get the just the flat rib blanks from me, then I don't mind sending a set of form blocks around. If we just keep passing that from builder to builder, um, and the, you know, then it's just the cost of shipping. Granted, they're you know, it's probably forty or fifty bucks for shipping, but um, anyways, so I'll just kind of put that out there. We can talk about that more, but um, yeah, I think sharing some of that stuff around is a good thing. So, does yeah, anyone? information Sorry. fuel tanks uh for the seven or for the the seven and whether they're going to be updated in the five or what's going on so the i think the five is just as it is although i you could you could talk to uh glenn or dave about whether you could use the seven tanks i talked to dave earlier this week and the seven tanks are completely 100 percent in front of the spar so that means that um yeah, there, there, it's definitely, there's some different, there's some changes to the rib locations between the CX-5 and the CX-7 uh, wings. Um, the other thing that that I caught um, on the plans, the CX-7, um, excuse me, the CX-7 spars are, um, the, the spar web is 0 .040 uh, aluminum, whereas the CX-5, let's see, let me repeat that. Let me say, say that just to make sure I get that right. The CX-7 wing spar web is 0 0.040. The CX-5 wing spar web is 0 0.032. And so there's a difference there. So Dave was saying that we could just build the CX-5 wings and they'd be identical to the for the seven, but there's, there's a couple little changes and you'd have to talk to him about the details of why those changes and if you can get away with a 032 um, spar web. Oh, cool, Jeff, I saw you drop and come back. So you... Uh, yeah, I tried cool. it. Yeah, and I know we're kind of moved on from this anyway, but no, it's all right. I'll be I'll be I'll be quicker the next time around. But that's just a photo of of uh, drilling up uh, my spars, the the center section here, and I don't know what the left or right uh, spar shooting out over that way. It was nice to drill it on the on the press like this, just have everybody everything kind of clamped down and measured out right. I will say, going back to that question about drilling, you know. When I built my Sonics, you know, that's that, that, you know, you build the wings and the spars kind of slide together in a spar box in the center of the fuselage and you drill that on the plane. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if you built a full wing panel and then drilled these holes later, that'd be, you know, probably a little closer to the Sonics process than, um, than, than this. So I would say this is a luxury, you know, to be able to drill it this way, but it's definitely not necessary. Um, so, Jeff? yeah. Would you uh, do the group a favor and post this onto the groups.io? Sure. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. And I, I hear what you guys, I should be better about posting some pictures out there. Um, 
Uh, but because I think, you know, I'm never sure if it's useful or not, or if it's just confusing. And I, I think a little bit like, like Norm, I'm always a little, I'm not always sure that the way I'm doing things are right. So I'm always a little hesitant to kind of share out my stuff, like with the group. I would, t- I would throw out one right now that I, it took me a few tries to get a good aileron bent up. And, uh, and I did the Home Depot, you know, 10 foot break, uh, just renting it, you know, for a half a day. And um, what I learned there was I kept laying out my aileron. There's like a nice right angle on the aileron when you look at it on the plans with a straight edge along an edge of a sheet of aluminum. But what I kind of figured out was you really need to lay out the aileron on the aluminum with the trailing edge running parallel with the grain of the aluminum. And then, and then I was able to get a nice good bend on that trailing edge. But, but if, you, if you do it the way you kind of think you should to be most efficient with the aluminum and waste the least amount of fuselage, that trailing edge is at just a little bit of an angle to the cross to the grain of the aluminum. And I, I always ended up with a bow using the, you know, kind of the cheap uh, siding break rented from Home Depot. But I, I should post that too, because that, that, it took me a few tries and every one you mess up, there's a lot of aluminum that yeah. ends up getting wasted. But, and Norm just going all the way back and then I'll shut up for a while. I'm on my third canopy on my Sonics. So I, w- I don't, if you're, you know, if you're just going toward your second, you're, you're still way ahead uh, of the game with me. So, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, I appreciate the uh, emotional support. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought of another mistake that we, we made recently. So I, I, I uh, got all the, the bulkheads for the CX-7 drawn up, all the different pieces and everything. And uh, so I had, I had uh, uh, Clico together. These are the, these are um, two. This is not a correct assembly. This is practice for my son uh, riveting. So, but uh, so I form these up, and you see how they're they're flanged both the same direction. And so I I gotten this thing clicoed together the, the the whole bulkhead, and I thought, oh hey, this is great, whatever. And I posted a picture on Instagram or something or on the the forum, and uh, somebody comes back and says, um, yeah, you you you, you want to flange them opposite so this piece would would stay proud but these would actually be formed backwards so uh so your um your rivet line would be in line otherwise it would kind of jog over and uh yeah so i see that i'm like i'm like oh yeah like i I mean i I knew that i knew that but i did it wrong you know so one of those little stupid things so anyways um but i gotta you know my son was able to spend some time riveting and practicing up and now we uh have a little showpiece back here so yeah that up here as a reminder to make sure you think about things otherwise you're going to make up scrap parts so keeps us humble yeah yes that's right. i'll show you guys one more thing real quick i was uh a little while ago i don't know how you guys test this is my the fuel tank i just finished up and i i had one leak that i fixed up last weekend I, you know, I don't know how you guys do it. I found that if you're real careful pulling, you know, one of these surgical gloves over the vented fuel cap, you can get it to seal up good. And then I just pump, you know, a couple pumps with a bike uh, pump uh, in through uh, um, one of the drains on the bottom and just do two or three pumps of air into the tank. And um, so this has been holding, you know, air in the, I don't know, as long as we've been on this call, I guess, a little over an hour now. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that tank's good. Um, I don't know if you guys have a better way of doing that or testing these things, but that's, that's been my method here, but. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, I was going to say the only thing I would worry about with that is if the air, air temperature is warming up, it could be a false. Um, I know, um, yeah. when I was a, in high school, we built a house and we did all the plumbing, all the electric, all the stuff ourselves. And one of the things we did for our, um, I think it was the plumbing. You had to hold five pounds of air for 24 or 48 hours. So okay. you just put a, a cap on with a with a gauge on it. it. You know, put air pressure up to five pounds or I don't. Know, I think it was like five pounds. It was pretty low. And then um, you just let it sit for however many hours. I don't know if you if you can put a cap on that would hold pressure. Or most caps are vented, so that might be kind of weird. But yeah, just a thought. When, anyway. when I- yeah, no, that's a good thought. When I did when I did the other tank uh, down at the other end of the bench there, um, 
when I did that one last year, I, I used the same method and I'm up in Minnesota. So I'd come out to the garage it'd be freezing cold. The glove would be hanging there. I'd turn the heater on and, you know, two hours later, the glove would be standing up again. So yeah, it's a good point, but, um, yeah, I don't know. That's, uh, I, I, I didn't build the tanks for the Sonics. You know, I bought their plastic tank. So this is the first time I've tried to build a, a tank. So I'm, I don't know. I'm hoping I got it, but we'll see. Yeah. Are there any tanks out there that would fit in the, into the wing panel? I'm just curious if there's something, um, already out there that's produced and commercially available that you can put into the wing panel because I would imagine there's several planes out there that have the similar similar dimensions just anyone have any idea if not that's fine I was just curious I know for the CX-4 there's a few guys using um, some of those roto molded um, fuel cells for race cars I think I, I, I could be a little off it might be for tractors or something but they're using some of those um, I think there's been some discussion uh, I think it was last year Air Venture one of the guys was saying that he had done that um, as I far as one of those do you okay okay what yes, do you I do what uh what did you end up using it's it's a uh summit uh i believe it's a 12 gallon tank is that fits that's for your four, very right? well the only, right yeah the mm -hmm. only downside is it doesn't reach all the way up to the top of the uh cowling so i had to make a, a snout that extended from the top up Okay, kind of an extension piece then. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, as far as the five and the seven, I, I don't know. I haven't looked into it, but yeah, I think one. Um, I I haven't seen too many of those roto molded tanks being used in aircraft, and I'm not sure if there's a reason why. Um, I don't know if you guys have a different experience, but uh, by roto molded, I mean like those um, they're poly, whatever poly. I don't know what are poly styrene, ethylene, whatever it is, tanks, the black plasticky looking ones that they use, like um, like uh, Ron was saying with his CX-4. Um, but I, I mean, I think to me, that would seem like a really good tank to use um, if we can find something that would fit and have a decent capacity. Um, the reason I'm asking is I, uh, although I do like building, I like finishing better. And so what I've been doing is anytime I've, I've come up to a point where I think that, you know what, that's a lot of work for, but I wonder if there's something easily available that I can use instead. And I've done that with um, like the air vents. I use Vans air vents instead of using the ones that, um, that are recommended in the plans. I use the square ones. I don't know if you can see that. You can't see that. But anyway, to use for the, um, the, the step. Well, I took one from Vans. I think it's for an RV7. It's meant for the right, the right side of the plane. Yeah. But anyway, I saved myself a few build hours by just buying something off the shelf and making it work on my plane. So anyway, I'll probably do a little research to see if we can find a fuel bladder that'll fit into the wing panel, the, the bay of that wing, to sort of uh, speed up construction completion. But we'll see. If I have to, I'll build a fuel tank. Uh, the Summit Racing Catalog has many tanks, and they have the dimensions also um, in the catalog. Nice, good deal. Thanks. Good to know. I've got a. Um, I did a. It's kind of the most boring video in the world, but I did a time lapse of me building the second tank, which I can I can kind of share. I'll figure out how to get that on YouTube or something, and right, and it's just me wasn't around you know but it's kind of shows what goes into scratch building a tank you know and um yeah it's a it's a fair number of hours you know and if, if there was something available that'd definitely be nice and you probably have to worry a little bit less about whether or not it's going to hold fuel but yeah yeah exactly question is there an inherent problem with making one of carbon fiber I, you cut out there a little bit i missed part of your question there is there an inherent problem with making one out of carbon fiber? I wouldn't know. I, I don't think so. I, I think uh, there's there's many composite aircraft that use wet wings. So I, I would think it would be a matter of what epoxy and what, um, you know, what the actual fiber material you're using and how, you know, that sort of thing. But I mean, I'll put it this way, like 
my business insurance wouldn't want me to say anything, you know, on record or anything. But I mean, I, I, I my gut feeling is that you could probably do that just fine. The reason I'm asking is we've had on the on the groups.io we've had such a long discussion about um, gunk in the fuel in the fuel tanks in the fuel system uh, with and without ethanol uh, uh, fuels and that sort of thing and just wouldn't want to build in a suicide kit. Right. Well, metal tanks. Everybody has different opinions. They say you have to weld them. You can't weld them. You know, you uh, you know, use composite. Don't use. I, it's I'm an experiment. I think it's everybody, but yeah, try it. There, <clears throat> there are a, a lot of uh, different ways that people have built tanks, and the guys I've seen that have built composite tanks, it, it's all dependent on the epoxy. Sometimes the uh, ethanol is an issue; will attack the epoxy, so it's need to really do your homework before you build something like that right this is that summit tank i was talking about uh yeah cool thanks ron it fits it pretty well it, it extends a little bit past that second bulkhead but i think it's something that can be worked around as you can see it's got a it's got an extended filler neck which uh is not a flush filler cap, but I might build a flush filler cap for it at some point. But right now, this was an easy way to get it operational. Very cool. Nice. Yeah, that's good. I know uh, Adrian Cooper he, uh, from Australia, he was saying at uh, AirVenture last year um, on the topic of fuel tanks in the CX-4, he, um, he needs to do like extra long flights and so he was able to get like an extra two or three gallons by ch by um, changing the upper area of his CX-4 tank. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly how it worked, but um, when when the aircraft is sitting, uh, you know, level, there's like an extra pyramid-shaped thing area up there underneath the the cowl that you can add like an extra, basically an extra. I think he got two or three gallons out of that. So that might be something to um, ask on the forum. Um, if uh, if you're interested in, in uh, getting every last bit of uh, fuel space. This, this holds 12 gallons, but and it doesn't have anything that, that hangs down between your knees. It's, there's much more room down around your feet area, too. Nice. Very good. I'd recommend that uh, anybody that has fuselage tanks do not attach the filler neck directly to the outer skin. Keep it separate. Yeah, that's a good point, Martin. Can you say that one more time, Martin? I kind of I missed a little bit of that too. Sorry. When I was working on my four, I was going to go with wing tanks because one, I don't like fuse. I don't like fuel in the fuselage. Uh, T18s have a lot of fuel in the fuselage. But uh, if anybody's familiar with old Ford pickup trucks, when you have filler necks that are attached to the outer body and you have any type of a hard landing or incident where you deform the outer skin, uh, you all of a sudden you're going to have a bath of fuel on you. So I want to attach the filler neck on the fours to the outer skin. I'd keep it separate. Um, I had a couple of uh, questions asked in the chat, uh, just privately. Um, has anyone on the CX-4 uh, had to do wash out or uh, wash in or out on the wings yet? Has any of your four, CX-4 builders? Martin, I know you, yours is flying, right? Or close to flying, oh. right? Mm -hmm. no. Okay, I, and I know you said you switched to the CX-5, so maybe maybe you're not that far. Okay, so maybe we don't have an answer for that. Um, the other uh, question on Ron on your tank there that you were showing, uh, what's the clearance of your rudder, rudder pedals? Uh, I know you said that there was a lot more room around your feet. Hope oh, you're on mute here. I couldn't there. tell you exactly what the clearance is, but there's plenty down there. Okay, all right. Cool, thank you. Good deal. 
All right, well, we've gone past our time and everybody has airplanes to work on. Um, the only other thing I wanted to just put in everybody's minds is, uh, um, so I, I'm planning on going to Sun and Fun since Air Venture is canceled. Um, so I hopefully we'll have the CX-7 there. I mean, I'm quite a ways, Air Venture's a haul for me, but it's a lot closer than Sun and Fun. So we'll kind of see, but hoping to have the CX-7 there. Um, try and get a booth and such. Uh, but uh, before Sun and Fun, so that's a year away. Any thoughts on um, trying to do a meetup, um, you know, get together, doing something, um, you know, and, and we don't have to come up with answers or anything, but just start thinking about that. If there's a, you know, maybe September, October, November area uh, timeframe, um, you know, if I, if I had uh, my druthers, I'd, uh, you know, get the CX-7 far enough along that I could toss it in a trailer and, just tour the country and stop by everybody's shop and say hi and you know that sort of thing. But uh, uh, I don't think uh, financially that's going to happen. <laughs> so, but uh, anyways, on um, the clearance of that fuel tank, it's uh, three inches between the bottom of that fuel tank to the top of the rudder pedal. And my rudder pedals are way forward from most people's. So further back they are, the more clearance you'll have. Okay, cool. Good deal. Thanks, Ron. Ben, regarding your idea, uh, that sort of thing might be better, we might be able to better organize that or at least understand the, the likelihood of it or possibility of it if we knew where everybody was located physically, not address, but, but city and state. Yeah, that's something we were talking about last week on the call is that we need a better, we need a, not necessarily a map, well, hey, a map, whatever, just something where we can see. And I know the CX-7 community or CX-4 community site had something like that or has something like that uh, that Todd is uh, maintaining, but he hasn't really updated it recently. Um, so I would like to put that on my site. Um, my The software I'm using, though, um, it's not really, I need to move off of it. So I'm trying to balance keeping my site up to date and information out there with trying to get the CX-7 going. Um, I might just have to take a week and, and put into uh, getting this um, site updated and move to a new platform. Um, maybe I'll, I'll shoot for the, uh, the end of May for that. Um, but yeah, anyways, I'd like to get a knowledge base up so we can capture some of this information in a, at something that you maybe a date, call it a Dave approved uh, format. Um, here is the approved way of doing this. Um, so we aren't hunting and pecking and looking for, like we were talking before, there's four or five different ways of doing a canopy to turtle that uh, joint, right? Uh, and then also a map of builders. So uh, last, last call, there were three guys that live in uh, close proximity to each other that didn't know each other. So that was kind of cool to, to find out. So um, so once the social distancing thing is over, then they can go and hang out and ch help each other and check out their each, other, each other's builds. So. I, I have the idea about the... Uh, meet up uh, I could plan to do that but uh, and also putting some on your website with all the geographical locations I just think that's a great idea yep hey Ben too you know on on the I mean it is such a bummer that Oshkosh got canceled this year I think and having your fuselage build there would have been huge but and I but I think the main benefit would have been not for us because we're following you and we're kind of keeping up with you as things go, but it would have been reaching out to those people that aren't currently that don't have the Thatcher planes on their radar right now to begin yep. with, you know? And I, I'm wondering if like, I, I think it'd be cool if Oshkosh, if EAA mm -hmm. start to promote things like this, you know, like the fact that we're getting together on some Saturday mornings um, and, and promote that to the non, to, to their whole hundred thousand or 200,000 or however many people they have on their email list. And maybe right. we get some non Thatcher people and we plan on doing some like tours or like, you know, this is my builder, this is my plane. But like Norm mentioned before, Glenn's one, Glenn's video, the close up walk around of the CX-5, you know, down there in Pensacola, that I'm like Norm. I watched that video. I've watched it a hundred times. It feels like and pausing it, and you know, and so that might just be a way to get some new people in, which yep. you know would be great. I, know, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys follow. There's uh, Brian Wallstrom has that experimental aircraft channel on on YouTube, um, and he, uh, yeah, definitely go check that out. I'll try. I'll. Uh, it's um, 
anyways, he, he went down and uh, did a tour of the CX-7, um, and he also did some uh, video of the CX-5. I don't think the 4 was there, but he's down in, in the Florida area. I've gotten to know him over the last couple of years over some um, kind of uh, uh, common interests and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think doing something like that would be kind of cool. Um, and but I guess one thing I was in the back of my mind, I was kind of thinking is like having a half hour call with Norm, just maybe one-on-one -on -one between me and Norm and then me and Jeff and then each one of you guys, Bert and, and everybody, and just, you know, have you guys kind of tour around your shop and kind of show and ask some questions. And maybe we do a, maybe it's a two hour call that we edit down to 15 minutes or half an hour or something of, you know, but I think that'd be kind of a, a nice thing to do. And now that being said, it's a little bit selfish because it's, for me, it's, it is a business thing, but on the other hand, honestly, you can build yeah. it from, plan. so, you know, but I think it'd be good. It's, I don't, I don't think it's selfish for you at all, Ben, because I, I think the bigger the community is around the plane, the better off all of us are even, I mean, even like looking way down the road, even like for the eventual selling price of our airplanes, the more of these that are out there, the bigger the community is, the more it benefits all of us. If it, and if it's good for your business, all the better. But I think, uh, I think the more active the community is around the Thatcher designs, the, the better off we all are. So I'd right. be up for that. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, I mean, Zenith learned that a long time ago and Chris Hines really drilled it in, I think, to Sebastian that, you got to keep the scratch builders going too. The majority of the business is kits, but they still support the scratch builders. Yeah. And I think it gives them credit that they're one of the few manufacturers that still do that. And yeah. I think in the long run, it gets them a lot more business than it hurts them. So. Yeah, I, I think so too. Like I said, you know, before about my, the spars and stuff, the, the thing I'm not so concerned about giving out, dimension drawings to you guys who have purchase plans and are actively building. My only fear would be that these, you know, Chinese ripoff companies are going to get something where they can just start knocking out parts. And it's not about competing against you guys, the plans builders. It's about competing against some other manufacturer for me um, from a business standpoint. Um, but anyways, yeah. So, but yeah, um, if you guys are interested, if you guys have any questions about any of the things I'm making and need like dimensions or like the spars are really like, I have hours and hours and hours into getting those dimensioned. And, um, so that's something that like, I, I can share like the intercostal, the rivet holes are not, are not a big deal. They're just inch and a half spacing or inch spacing or whatever. But, um, but yeah, just give, shoot me an email or give me a call or something. And I can probably get most of that stuff over to you guys of what I've, I've already drawn up, so. It uh, I, I gotta drop off, guys. Um, I, got, oh. I got some things I gotta do here, but thanks again, Ben, for setting this up. It was good to talk with all of you and hope we do it again soon, next week yeah, or whatever. Can. Yeah, we'll try. Right. I think I'm gonna try and keep doing it on, on uh, it, does this time work good for everybody or otherwise maybe we'll do it yeah. like a, yeah? yeah? Okay, all right. Good. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I don't know if I wanna put my boulders log online, that could be a little bit too revealing and embarrassing. But let's say I did want to share, you know, some information, some pictures. There's a lot of forums out there. And frankly, I'm not sure which one is best for me to post, like, for example, the crack in my canopy or showing um, how I fit something. Mm -hmm. Of all the different things out there, which one do you think I should be doing that for the benefit of the people on this call? Uh, which Any builder's opinion? blog software? Or? Well, yeah, either a software, a Facebook page, the ThatcherGroups.io. Um, you know, you've got Pat Panzera involved. You've got yourself who has a, you know, an LLC or whatever you call it. You got Thatcher Aircraft. Um, I'm just curious which is appropriate. Or do you think, because you're, you've been involved in this, should I pick one of those sites and then post some pictures, if not the whole uh, maybe a owners maybe make it under the format of a of a builder's log, but only post some you know general things that I think would be of interest. Any opinions on that? Or you could or you could post things and saying and say don't do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, Good point. <laughs> I mean, no. I think, yeah, from a builder's standpoint. Oh, somebody else is talking. Yeah, sorry, Norm, your canopy, don't give up. I've repaired canopies quite a few times on gliders. 
and uh, I used a two-part uh, adhesive. It was a ratio like 50 to 1 or something of the hardener and the, and the resin. And what happens is you, you uh, use a Dremel and you, you grind out the crack as a sort of a V-shape. And you go halfway through the, the perspex or the, the plastic with this groove. You put tape behind it. And you, you set this whole thing up horizontal and with a syringe, you, you build up a layer of this, this resin into the crack. And after about a couple of hours, you, you pull the tape off, turn it around the other way, and you, you uh, grind the groove out up to the depth of where you had the adhesive from the other side. And you drip the, this resin in, and then you polish it. It's a lot of work sanding it out. In the end, you can hardly see where that crack is. It's unbelievable. A very, very slight, perhaps, yellow tinge where that adhesive is. And uh, I can't remember the name of the stuff now. It's a long time I've, since I've done it, but I've done a few. Don't throw the canopy away. Look, research for that, that uh, resin. Thank you. I, I read uh, something called Acrofix is used. It's a, it's a, that's something I've heard about, but I've also read articles, maybe you wrote it, I don't know, but <laughs> sounds like it, about doing the V-groove and uh, this epoxy. I will do some more research. Um, frankly, I'll probably get to that. Yeah, I'm going to get to it eventually, but I'm probably not going to repair the canopy this week. But um, I'm going to do all the research before I proceed. Thank you very much. That's good to know. Norman, uh, one, one thing, uh, I've, I've had a couple of uh, windshield repairs on my cars done by SafeLight, and they've got, uh, you know, we have just a chip in, in it, in the glass, and they've got a, a resin they, they use, uh, and then end up polishing things out. So you might check with those folks, just a thought. Thank you. I used to race motorcycles and on the windscreen, um, th sometimes you get cracks too, and it seems like there's a company called Novus that either had repair epoxy or they had like the buffing stuff. It was like N-O-V-U-S. Might want to look into that. Um, it's been 20 plus years since I did that because I don't race motorcycles now. <laughs> I'm too old. <laughs> but um, Yeah, there it is. It's uh, right bummer. here. There's, I just stop drilled it right here, but there's the crack. Hmm. See? And so I was thinking about doing a quick fix, like using a piece of metal trim strip and going around so I make it look like a, a faux two-part ca canopy. But anyway, that's that's where I'm at. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody know what happened to that guy on the East Coast that was putting the YouTube videos out? I think he was in the- Oh, Jason Stahl, that guy? Was that, I don't remember his name. He was building yeah, a CX-5 at a, like a tech center or something. Yep. Yeah, I just ran across his videos this week, actually. Uh, no, I, I have no idea what happened to him. I just know he kind of stopped. I think he had moved. Moved? Right. He, was in, he was in the process of moving, and that's what stopped the videos. But I don't know where he's set up again. Yeah, I've, I've never talked with him. But, uh, yeah, he because he was doing a good job. He's water jet cutting stuff, and he was doing all kinds of stuff. So And it was, it was good information, too. So right. I went to his Facebook page, and... From what I saw, I didn't see any airplanes on it. It's like he dropped out of the aviation scene. So I, I understand. I had the same question. I was looking for the same videos. No luck. Did you did you find his videos though, uh, Norm? Or yeah, I, I found them right off and was looking at them and analyzing okay. them. But okay, the same I wasn't sure if you, meant, you could guys. find them. I can't or... find them anymore. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he has any new ones. Okay. Yeah, it's been a few years. But okay. All right. Well, um, yeah, I think we probably should call this for a little over time, which is fine. Um, uh, anybody have any last uh, things to go over or talk about? Or Otherwise, I'll probably just set up another one of these up for next Saturday, same time, same place. Yeah, hopefully we can get Glenn to be available. Yeah, it looks like you popped in but then dropped off or something. So, uh, yeah, or, Dave kind of... would be, or Dave, too, for that matter. Yeah, that would be good, too. So. Um, say hi or something yeah cool all right well thanks for joining everybody and yeah good discussion if you guys have any thoughts on uh any topics or anything for the future uh, and, uh 
it's kind of informal as you can tell right now i just you know figure at some point we should probably start going over different things so people know oh this is an engine week or this is a wing build week or this is a yeah but um and uh hopefully i'll, I'll have a little bit more I'll, I'll maybe try and join from the shop uh next week and uh be able to show you progress a little bit more um it's just kind of a noisy mess right now so but, well thanks for all your uh work and help here ben we all appreciate it oh yeah heck yeah no this is this is good this is fun for me too so yeah it's not it's not work it's just chatting with friends so it's good cool well thanks guys take care thanks everybody for joining hey, have thanks, a good Saturday. Bye. 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 all right bye guys